Hey, this is John and Ben. Welcome to Artematics 5 Plus 5. Here at Artematic, we're pushing the boundaries of AI and art. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about GANs and a tweet by Andre Karpathy. And the deal with this is we have a five minute timer, just so I'm not cheating here. Five minutes. <laughs> so we're going to start with Ben first. I'm going to press the timer and he's going to get five minutes to talk about GANs or generative adversarial networks. So ready? Here we go. Three, Let's two, see. One, go. In the field of AI, I really like things that reflect real life, the things we can see on an everyday basis. And I think generative adversarial networks are just one of these things. Uh, they're a type of neural network architecture that uh, relies on two different neural networks that try to trick one another. Um, they've been hugely successful over the past five years uh, and really pushed a lot of the, the boundaries of creative AI forward. Uh, there's some new stuff that's been happening lately that I'll talk about in some next episodes. Uh, but for now, yeah, I'm going to dig into GANs. So there's two neural networks, like I said, there's a generator and a discriminator. The generator is what is generating the art or whatever you're trying to create. The discriminator is there to try to tell if whatever's coming into it is from a generator or if it's real data. So they go back and forth of the generator producing something that starts pretty bad um, you could imagine an image, it might just be completely static. Uh, the discriminator takes in two inputs. It takes in a real picture, for example, and the generator's input, and it tries to tell which one of these is real, which one's fake. Um, in the beginning, it might actually have a tough time telling if a real image of, say, a dog or a picture of complete noise is real. Um, but they slowly go back and forth, their gradients improve, and um, eventually you end up with some pretty amazing art. Um, one of the biggest and most important uh, neural network GANs has been Style GAN um, and Progressive GAN. Uh, my favorite is Progressive GAN. It works by starting with small images of just like 16 by 16 and uh, 16 by 16 pixels and they go back and forth until this really small image if you can imagine is close enough to a very scaled down version of that image you're going for and once it's good uh, they pop up to a 32 by 32 keep training 64 by 64 and you can keep doing this all the way up to um, whatever image size your gpu can handle <laughs> Uh, so basically it starts itty bitty and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's had some great success, but it tends to top out at 128, 256, 512 um, image sizes. And the 1024 resolution images have just proven to be a little too much. So it's... It's been needed. It's been iterated on. StyleGAN is something that's a little too much for this uh, video, but right. I would <laughs> implore you to go check it out. Right. Um, and if there's enough interest, we can always have like another one just on StyleGAN. So yeah, yeah explain yeah. it in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. You got one and a half minutes left, so go for it. <laughs> um. Uh, I guess one metaphor that I really like that summarizes GANs is the uh, the metaphor of the art uh, forger and a um, art uh, police, I guess. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> a critic. <I> don't <laughs> An art know. critic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this art forger starts off as, let's say, like a 10-year-old, and they're and they're trying to create some art. They're trying to copy the Mona Lisa. And this critic's also a 10-year-old. And it doesn't really know at first. It can guess. Uh, and, and they go back and forth as they age. And, and each one of them gets better. Um, and this art forger keeps practicing forging the Mona Lisa. And it keeps getting caught. Or some actually pass uh, the, the critic. And it learns that uh, the, this, this kid learns what... Uh, 
what is important? What is what are these features of the painting that really make it the Mona Lisa and and make it passable? Cool. Um, yeah, and it's I think it's important to note that you've got there's two things. Both of them are learning. Both the generator and the discriminator are both learning at the same time. So, mm -hmm. and it's actually one of the hard parts about training them is to get them to learn at the same time. Like if the discriminator, like if the art police gets good too fast, then it'll always know and the other thing won't have a chance to learn. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a balancing act of making sure that one doesn't <laughs> right. learn too quickly and surpass the other. <clears throat> yep. Exactly. Uh oh, we are at one second and oh, it didn't make a sound. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I was waiting for it to go ding, ding, ding. But anyway, yes, we are out of time. So hopefully that was good for people. Obviously, ask questions in the comments if you have them, because we can always do another one that dials in more specifically on, on individual things. All right. Uh, so I'm going to start your timer, John. You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All Ready, right. Go. I did a timer on my end too, just so I would know and I'd be able to cheat. Okay. So I want to talk about a couple of tweets from Andre Carpathy uh, just in the past few days. And I think it's really cool because it's actually talking, he's talking about something becoming a reality that in the 1980s and like William Gibson's Neuromancer and other novels, um, I'm thinking like Neil Stevenson and stuff, also Snow Crash, that these were like science fiction worlds of like immersive virtual reality worlds. And Carpathy is talking about the possibility that this, this could actually become real. So I think it's pretty cool and worth at least thinking about a little bit. All right, so Carpathy, and by the way, if you don't know, he was the lead of AI at Tesla until he very recently um, uh, took a sabbatical and then, I don't know, has decided to become unemployed and do other things for a while. He's actually doing really cool stuff. So you should follow his YouTube channel and his Twitter account for sure. Anyway, he says, vision may be a high enough throughput input to the brain that is also sufficiently connected to its reward modules that AI-assisted generative art may converge to wireheading. Probably nothing. Now he, you know, kind of backs off at the end of this, but the wire heading is definitely a reference to things, you know, from the cyberpunk sort of genre, which is basically if you imagine Neuralink or another company like that, where you can plug electrodes directly into your brain. And what that would do is give you access to the potentials, like some of the really, really cool stuff that's going on with Dolly and Stable Diffusion. And we'll talk about these in future episodes, obviously. But that sort of world, he's saying that we could plug that directly into our brain. So forget about like computer monitors, you know, that I'm looking at right now, or forget about VR glasses, but like, let's plug this straight into our brains. If this stuff can get fast enough <laughs> and generate image quickly enough, we could have a world that's way cooler than the real world and it would plug straight into our brains and we wouldn't even have to like actually use our eyes for anything. So very much along the lines of what people in the 80s and 90s were talking about for cyberpunk. We then get something from Ben Poole here that says, you know, the real reason so many of us has been addicted to research and generative models for so long is nothing beats the reward of a batch of fresh samples, which is very, very cool. Ben, I think you can agree to that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Getting <laughs> output you didn't expect and yeah. just, it, it can be, it's so rewarding. <clears throat> It's, it's very cool. It's like super cool. And so then uh, Carpathy says, nothing beats the reward of a batch of fresh samples. Now, how would you like them at 60 hertz in 4K in a cool pattern and personalized? So the idea is how far can we push these things? You know, we've got transformers, we've got um, diffusion models, we've got GANs that Ben talked about. All of these things if we just keep pushing the technology, both the hardware and the software, we could eventually get to something where we could be 30 to 60 frames a second, just like you're watching on your television set or on your computer monitor, but we're getting all artificial intelligence all the time. So it's not taking minutes or hours to render out, the, render out these images, but fractions of a second. And if that happens, that is a really, really different world. And then the final uh, tweet from him, is it would feel like tripping on a fully immersive AV or audio video or VR experience that you can't or don't want to pull yourself away from. And that was the thing that really struck me with all of this. Cause I was like, that was the whole point. Um, I think, is it ready player one? Also, if I'm remembering correctly, that was also like a, a immersive reality thing. So anyway, there's a lot of novels that have fictionalized this and have talked about this as being a really cool possibility for science fiction, but we are actually getting kind of close to the possibility of doing this 
in real time in reality instead of in science fiction now at yeah. present what you could do of course is you could spend hours rendering out in fact on like like i said you should look at andre's youtube channel but um he'll and i'll put a link to that in the description by the way but you can spend hours like overnight rendering out 20 or 30 seconds of video and it's really really cool and then you can watch it on a monitor or you could put on vr glasses but what if we can keep compressing this so instead of hours to render this out you can do it in basically real time even at one frame a second, it would be pretty cool. But then if you could shrink that down where it's doing 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 frames a second. And at the same time, you can be requesting what it's doing next. And at the same time, it's not something that you're watching on a pair of goggles or watching on a monitor, but it's actually in your brain. There's a reasonable chance if that comes to pass that there will be a large group of people, especially if we get the Tesla bot. That, thank you. Yeah. Especially <laughs> if we get the, <laughs> I did notice that, especially if we get something like the Tesla bot that does all the work for us. Just imagine people are going to be like, well, I don't have to be in reality. I'm just going to plug this stuff into my head, you know, just like the matrix, plug it into the back of your brain and go and just, you know, just enjoy the ride and don't deal with reality. So there's, there's a, there's a, a positive and negative, a light side and a dark side to this, but really, really interesting. Oh. All right. So there we go. That was two topics in five and five minutes. I think Ben actually has some comments on what I said. We're doing this real time, by the way, folks. We like neither one of us has seen what the other person is doing. So it's real real yeah. time reaction. So what's your reaction to what I did? Yeah. No, that's a lot of stuff. Um <laughs> Clifton Strengths Finder has this uh like 52 strengths. Um, and one of them is future futurism. And man, you ha you just like totally intuited all of your futurism <laughs> right into there. <laughs> just went for it. Well, it. I have to say I'm channeling other people. Like yeah. I said, it's very yeah. cyberpunk. And it's a so. collection of other people's ideas and you know yeah. <laughs> what you believe in too. Yeah, I I um I mean I I've been using Dolly uh, and playing around with that, and it's just single frames that uh, you generate. But right. I've been getting like addicted to just that. I can only imagine oh, yeah. if we can increase the speed of generation. Right. Well, I mean, just and also if we get OK, even forgetting about the plug in aspect of it, if you have VR that has uh, um, natural language processing. Mm -hmm. So you could say, like, now generate me images of of, you know, monkeys surfing on the moon or something like that. Right. And so yeah. it just and so it interprets that and then can reproduce that at close to real time. But then, holy crap, if you can get that actually plugged directly into your brain, I can't I can't imagine a drug that would be more powerful. <laughs> it would be a little yeah. bit scary. <laughs> yeah, I might have to stick to the VR goggles for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a little bit much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're going to be the old generation. It'll be like, you know, your kids' generation will be like, Dad, come on, get the like latest plug in. And you're like, no, 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 thank you. <laughs> Back in my day, we had to strap goggles to our face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be for sure the, the thing that happens so <laughs> all right and then of course i mean and one of the enabling technologies for stuff like this is gans although sadly enough i feel like gans have kind of taken a little bit of a back seat in the last i mean like months <laughs> this yeah. stuff happens yeah. so rapidly it's absolutely it crazy um yeah we'll, we'll see what the uh, i mean the gan idea there's a lot you can do with it and expand off of it um style gans one where you have multiple but you have more than two neural networks. Right. Um, and if space complexity and time complexity isn't as much of an issue, and you can have um, a, like 20 neural networks doing this GAN style, try to fake it, try to catch it. <laughs> <Right. you, laughs> there's a lot you can still do with that. Right, right. And the, and the other thing is that there's, a lot of these architectures potentially could be combined with each other too. So there's always that possibility as well. Definitely. So, I mean, I could see a GAN that uses a diffusion model as kind of the basis for the generator. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I'm talking about that. an intense amount of compute power that you would need for all yeah. of that stuff to work. But anyway, so yeah, so we'll definitely talk about other things, but please in the comments, let us know, you know, what you're interested in as well, because we're certainly happy to talk about that. And we're trying to keep these reasonably short, you know, bite-sized things. So if we don't go into enough detail, just ask, and we can always do another one with more detail. And of course, please remember to like and subscribe because YouTube's algorithm really, really likes that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> and uh, check out our website, automatic.io. 
Absolutely. And in the meantime, we'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank you.